Hi, my name is Shannon Gibney, and I am a two-time Minnesota Book Award winner um, in the category of young people's literature. Um, since uh, last year for Dream Country, and um, once uh, in 2016 for my first uh, novel, which was See No Color. And I'm a huge fan of the Friends of the St. Paul Library, all their programming, which takes folks all over the state uh, to share in the written word, um, which of course, as I'm sure everybody watching out there knows, Minnesota is the place to be um, as far as enjoying the written word, um, writing yourself, uh, making community um, from the written word and um, organizations like uh, the Friends um, just make it all the richer. Um, so thank you for joining us. Um, welcome to this Authors and Conversations panel, which features 2020 Minnesota Book Award finalists from young adult and middle grade categories. The Minnesota Book Awards is a program of the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library in the organization's capacity as the Minnesota Center for the Book. This year's book awards are sponsored by Education Minnesota and the young adult category through the generosity of United Educators Credit Union. So joining me today are Naomi Kritzer, author of Catfishing on Patnet, which is published by Tor Tor Teen, Macmillan Publishing Group. Jacqueline West, author of Last Things, published by Green Willow, HarperCollins Publisher. Janata Petrus, author of The Scars and the Blackness Between Them, published by Dutton Books, Penguin Random House. And joining us from middle grade, Rebecca K.S. Ansari, author of The Missing Piece of Charlie O'Reilly, published by Walden Pond Press and HarperCollins Publishers. Thank you all for joining us today. Really appreciate it. So, um, yeah, so Naomi, um, my first question is, um, you know, what, what do you think are the most important things to keep in mind um, when writing for teens and middle grade readers? What do you think? I, I think the most, important, um, the most important thing to keep in mind is uh, making sure uh, you're giving the, the protagonist agency um, in some ways, like, uh, I feel like, like a big piece of books for, for kids and teens is the, is the fantasy of having a lot more agency than most kids have in the real world. Um, and, uh, you know, that can be like, there's, there's a, you know, there's a joke about like how you always kill off the mom, um, because it's, it's the only way to get her out of the way. Um, and I, I mean, I, I feel like that can be overkill, um, but you do have to like come up with ways to get helpful adults sufficiently out of the way that the kids have a chance to solve their own problems. Um, and you know, whether whether that's you know things like resolving you know resolving fights with friends, or if it's like you know battling dragons, you know, you need to you need to make sure that the kids have the opportunity uh, to do that. And um, so that's, that's what I see as the most important thing. I look forward to hearing other people's thoughts. All right. Well, I guess it's my turn if you want me to go next, Shannon. Um, I guess something that I try especially hard to keep in mind when I'm writing for um, young adult or middle grade, I do both, is voice. Um, and I find that even more fun in a way when I'm writing um, young adult because very often there it's it's so natural to use first person and so to really try to step completely inside of this other character into their thoughts and emotions and their worldview and to both try to authentically make that sound like a, a teenager someone much younger than I am now but someone for whom yeah that that world is everything their experiences inform the way that they look at everything around them and it's just that's such a pleasure that's one of my favorite things about writing um, so trying hard to keep in mind all the teenagers that I I know I mean I used to be a high school English teacher so I get to use all of that stuff now in the books that I write um, and also remembering my own childhood trying to just recenter yourself in how emotionally raw you are when you're younger I mean this just 
everything is a first, everything is new. And so you, you respond to it all with so much more intensity. And I think that's another one of the big pleasures of writing for younger readers is keeping that in mind. So yeah, voice for me is one of the big elements. Yeah, I feel like for me, so much of young adult writing has been like, how do I connect with the young person and the young spirit within me that I think is in a lot of ways what compelled me to write for young adults. Um, and I've done a lot of different kind of writing, you know, but I really think like so much of my young adult self wanted permission to, you know, love myself, to be joyful to find pleasure and i think so much of my like early kind of seeking as a young person was to be like like where is the wisdom that actually speaks to me and what i'll need um to live a magical and healed life not that i was able to articulate it that way but i feel like so much of young adult writing has been kind of therapeutic and like you know what sort of permission around sensuality and sexuality and um identity around you know blackness and knowing about my history and things like that um things that i really wanted to to know and see and like i, I was desperate to find but i do feel like so many books you know when i was younger um you know were things that gave me little bits of that you know so i think in writing my book like i really became like almost unapologetic around like yeah like what if this is like the talisman or the sort of you know um uh yeah a space of hope and possibility that these kids could come across in the ways that i so desperately needed um so yeah like i think that's been my like guiding light as a writer thank you so much janata moving on to uh rebecca you guys uh have taken so much of the good answers here <laughs> i'm like yes yes that's what i think too um I would say, in addition to what people have already said, I really enjoy the process of taking, um, when you're a kid, everything, like Jacqueline was saying, feels so first and raw and unique, and it is to that kid. And so I love the balance of taking that, but then also um, trying to, to bring out the universal in some of those experiences for kids as well. So. You know, in my book, there's a lot about forgiveness. And so the specifics of what's going on with the kids who feel so upset about the mistakes that they've made are very, very um, personal. But then try to take that for the readers to, and make it clear that these are things that we all struggle with, that are universal, even when they are very individualized and kind of help kids see that there is a bigger world around them that does understand even when you really don't feel a lot of times like people understand you at all and so try to take that very ironically global feeling that feels so isolated and kind of put a spotlight on it thank you so much those were fantastic answers uh completely off the cuff um our wonderful finalists were not sent the answers beforehand so you can tell how the creative juices and the intellectual fervor is always moving in them. So um, thank you so much. Um, and I have uh, one more question for each of you, um, really about the specificity of your own work. Um, so we're going to go back and we are going to start with Naomi. Um, so Naomi, I'm looking for the question. Here it is. Can you talk a little bit about the complex issues of online privacy and connection community, right? Um, sort of as a paradox, right? That you're, you explore in catching on CatNet. I mean, this feels like such a topical issue for teens today and you write about it and your characters with such humor and warmth. Uh, yeah, it's a really topical, um, a really topical issue for teens. Uh, they're, there was a period um, 15 or so years ago when there was sort of a collective parental freak out over like online teens. And uh, you know, the, every, I, my, kids, uh, my kids, I have two kids, they're 16 and 19. Uh, so, you know, 15 or 15 years ago, there was like this sort of like 
thing that went around, uh, you know, the parents circulated endlessly about how like our kids were going to like put all their information out there and they were going to like, you know, this is going to lead to all kinds of horrifying things that were going to happen to them. And like, um, what's fascinating, one of the things I find really fascinating is that in a lot of cases, what happened instead was that the parents put a lot of information about the kids online, like they blogged about their children and they posted 8 million pictures of them. And at some point the kids were like, actually, I would really like some privacy. Please take down all the pictures. Please stop talking about me online. Um, I want to be able to live my own life and not be instantly Googleable by anyone who knows you're my mom. And like that, um, uh, a lot of kids, I mean, there are kids that like live their lives in very public ways online, <clears throat> excuse me, um, uh, like YouTubers and TikTok stars and so on, but there are an awful lot of kids where like all their online information is locked down and it's not because their mom made them do it. It's because they're like, I don't want people to be able to find me. I don't want like creepy 35 year old men to hit on me. I don't want that. Um, I want to be able to connect with the people I want to connect with and, uh, and keep out the rest of the world. And that's, um, I think a lot more common than what parents were envisioning and fearing um, when social media um, first really exploded. Um, so at the same time, there's like, I mean, the internet is a huge um, place to connect. And that was true even before uh, the pandemic and social distancing. And of course, it's even more true now because like no one can get together with their friends. We're all figuring out ways to video chat and talk online and talk in ways that don't bring us physically face to face. And that's um, at least as true for teenagers as it is for adults, um, except in as much as like my kids were generally more comfortable with video chat <laughs> than I was before this started. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a paradox and I don't think I try to give any answers in my book really because I don't really have any answers, you know, this is just one of those things we all, the question of like privacy versus connection is always, it's always been a question, even before we had like online for it to be a question in. Um, and it's going to keep being a question. And it's certainly a huge, huge question right now because of the ways people connect or the ways people are connecting. Um, so. Um, okay, so we're going to move now to Jack. So you and I have talked, uh, you know, bit by bit about uh, so much of your work and how sort of the creepy factor, um, the um, ghostly factor, um, the terror factor, right? And I, I just wonder um, what that is just for somebody who I generally shy away from it because I don't enjoy getting freaked out. Um, but so many people do, right? And there's, I mean, we, we just got to admit that. And then also, there's something about that, um, because so many of your books have that sort of, whether it's magical, or whether it's sort of like a mystery and hinting at something diabolical going on. What is it about, about that, that thing, that sort of monster behind the door, perhaps, mm -hmm. that, that so intrigues you? um in your work and with this this last thing book as well i wonder if you could talk about that a little bit sure um so the honest truth is i am a total coward like i i am a person who is riddled with fears and i have always been and it's from like the the big classics like a fear of the dark fear of being alone to like i'm afraid of fish i, I get all like my heart flutters when the phone rings i have a bunch of stupid fears um and I think that that's the reason for me is I'm the person who I, I don't enjoy gore. I don't enjoy pain. Like there's a lot that horror leans on that is absolutely outside of my comfort zone as a writer or a reader or a viewer. Um, but fear and the manipulation of fear does interest me because I'm, like I said, a coward. And so when I get to play with that on paper, I cannot scare myself, no matter how hard I try. Instead, I get to be the one making my characters be braver than I am. 
And so in my books, they're often facing exactly the things that I would find most frightening, whether that's like a loss of power, a loss of someone they care about, they're stuck alone in the dark. Um, yeah, and then I get to, as, as the outside force, sort of watch and help them navigate their way through that. So yeah, it's, I mean, it's the classic answer of I get to confront the things that I would not want to confront in the real world in fiction. <laughs> That's what interests me. That's fair. That's totally fair. And you have this modicum of power um, mm -hmm. on the page that we don't, we don't really have in real life. So I feel that. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. Uh, moving on to uh, Janata Petras. Um, so many times, I mean, when we read stories, and let's be honest, Janata, you know, uh, a lot of them uh, that are written by white folks that, that have multi-ethnic and multi-racial characters, they feel flat and stock. Um, you know, throw in a Latinx character who speaks Spanglish here and a native character who smudges there. Um, but, you know, the stars and the blackness between us reads like the antithesis of this. I mean, that really struck me um, in the novel. You have Caribbean black characters, Oromo characters, you've got African American characters, and they all seem completely natural um, to their environment. Um, and, and well placed in the story. And I just wanted you to talk a little bit about how you achieve that, because that's not, that's not something that's easy to achieve. Um, I think I just, um, I think I just wrote from spaces that, um, you know, like, feel familiar to me. Like, you know, I, um, I'm a person who was born and raised in Minnesota. Um, both my parents are Caribbean. Um, so, so much of my identity in being a Black person was being a Black person that had this kind of like multicultural reality even within my home because my mom was from Trinidad. My dad was from the Virgin Islands and, you know, we were these American kids. So I think, you know, there's a lot of ways that um, Blackness was always very you know, multi, multi, multi-dimensional to me, you know, like, um, there's ways that, um, I feel like as a reader and as a writer, I very much like care for characters, um, on a soulful level. So of course it's like, you know, there's ways that, um, I wanted to include all of these layers to these young people, you know, that there's ways that, um, I also feel like, um, in writing the Trinidadian characters, like, you know, I, I went back to Trinidad where my mom is from and interviewed folks, interviewed um, LGBTQ people down there because although I'm queer, I was raised in the States and I didn't want to sort of assume anything about how queerness exists in Trinidad. Um, so I really got curious about like, even in so much of the knowledge and the reflections of these characters were aspects of my embodiment. Like there were other things that like, I just got to be limitlessly curious about, like how does queerness live in modernity um, in Trinidad as well as how does it live ancestrally? How do I imagine these things living ancestrally and whatnot um, in, in the cases that I couldn't get actual, you know, um, insights or what have you from people. Like, what ways do I get to fill in the blanks of these stories from within me? Um, so I think for me, like, that is a thing that, I, I don't think it's a thing, like, I try to do. Like, I don't feel like I had to try to make these characters deep. Like, I just, like, witness their depth, you know, in the ways that, like, I witness my own and those of people around me. Um, but I certainly, like, you know, wanted to be nuanced and, like, all right, you know, obviously no life, whether it's a queer life, a black life, a poor life, whatever life is a singular experience that is expansive to everybody, like they and them and within themselves, or they are singular experiences rather. Um, and I wanted to like give that all of the, you know, sort of juiciness that I genuinely feel um, around my own blackness, around the ways that I've encountered different people and realities within and beyond their blackness. So yeah, that was, you know, the way I navigated that. Well, that was quite a feat. And um, I know I'm not the only reader who enjoyed that. So thank you, Janata. 
Mm -hmm. And we're moving on, last but definitely not least, to Rebecca and Sari. Um, so, Rebecca, the missing piece of Charlie O'Reilly is many things. It's mystery, fantasy, it's a meditation on loss. Can you talk about how you went about integrating these disparate genres into a compelling novel for middle graders? Sure. <laughs> um, it started off entirely as a mystery. I wanted to have a kid that's missing, only the kids know about it, and now we gotta go find the kid. Um, and it wasn't until I started asking the bigger questions of, you know, a, a plot is not that interesting in the end. It, you know, to, you go on a journey, get your thing, whatever you're seeking and come home is not that particularly interesting. And so once I understood why, the kiddo was missing, then we started getting, I was able to layer in um, a lot of the uh, commentary on loss and regret and forgiveness. And um, then, and I also always love where rea reality takes off or the, 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 an element of the story leaves off from the reality that we all know. So, you know, it starts off as what just seems like a regular old day um, I like to call this the, the Harry Potter uh, setup of just everything's normal until it's deeply not normal. Like the, the letter comes from Hogwarts and we are off to a whole new place. In this case, it's the same thing with Charlie. Like everything's normal. He is a just regular old kid in a regular family who then has this bizarre occurrence happen that sucks him into an adventure that he didn't really ask to be part of. Um, and I think that, I think it's fun to have that be something that any kid can identify with because they are just in their regular family, in their home, in their regular life. And then it takes off from there, which I think is a really fun place to build on a kid's imagination. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's, Basically, the answer of why are all these things in there is because those are all the things I really love reading about and creating myself. Um, and I love having, like people have said, there's no real genre to stick it in because it does have these different elements. And I, I guess I would say that's one of the best compliments that I would want to hear, which is it just is, it is what it is. And it's, it became many things as I wrote it. and. That's what it was. <laughs> and here you are, a finalist for, for the NBA. So no problem with, uh, you know, cross genre, whatever. It works. No, story is a story is a story at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, so um, thank you, Rebecca. Um, thank you, Shannon. For, for that thoughtful answer. And thank you to all our finalists. I want to congratulate each of you. Uh, Rebecca, Janata, Jacqueline. Naomi, um, as well as all the other finalists that couldn't make it um, here today to have this discussion um, in the YA category, as well as the middle grade category. Um, these are vital, vital books um, for young readers across the state and beyond. So um, thank you so much and good luck to all of you as we head towards the awards announcements. Thank you.